Hungry, angry, mysterious. An incredible judge of, of character. A risk taker, quick on his feet. It's such a difficult thing to do. Iago is... He's a monster. <laughs> oh my God, I feel like giving him a hug and I don't, I don't, just right now. <laughs> What's wrong with you? You want a quick answer or a long one? <laughs> There's lots of words I can't use on camera for that. Uh, Iago is uh, a psychopath. Uh, my name is Graham Abbey. I'm playing Iago in Othello. I don't even know if Iago totally knows what it is that, that he wants that would give him satisfaction. The first thing that came to my mind is he wants people to like him, but that can't be. I think he wants Respect. I mean, he just wants to out and out destroy as many people as he can. Sometimes he needs me, but then just as quickly he turns cold. He definitely wants domination over Othello. He wants, in a way, to, to master the, the general. Oh, God knows what Iago's after. I mean, it's so, it is very interesting. Is He's after any number of things if you take his motives in the play. And so, in a weird way, maybe he's after nothing. He's just chasing something. I mean, I don't even know if he really knows what he's after, so. I, I, I don't know if he has a plan right from the start. I mean, I mean, lots of people, in, and in uh, John Murrell's wonderful play this year, Taking Shakespeare, he talks about uh, Othello just loving uh, uh, chaos, just doing it for the sake of, of really destroying people's lives. I, I, I don't know if it's that broad or random. It definitely is specific, but I think he just goes step by step. So as the play goes through and as Shakespeare wrote it, those really uh, those clues come to Iago and he's extremely smart. He, he's able to think on the spot um, and, and sort of weave his way through his destruction in that play. Uh, until he's not smart, until he sends Amelia to the Citadel um, ahead of him and he shouldn't have. And he underestimates the love that Amelia has for Desdemona. That love in the end is his destruction, is his undoing, something he doesn't understand. He's, I guess he's exciting to watch in the same way that Richard III is. You know, it's like one of those, those evil characters, but whose minds are so fascinating because they are geniuses. He thinks and acts with such alacrity that it's, it's breathtaking. He leaves everyone behind him. So he just struggles to keep up. Well, he's uh, an incredible improviser. And, 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 and super intelligent as well too. You know, he sets off with, with this desire to, to, um, to bring down Othello, but his plan isn't fully formed. So you see that plan evolving as the play progresses. I think right from the get-go, he lets us in on his story, on, on, on the plot he is about to unfold. And as audience members, we are complacent, uh, uh, compliant even. And it's a, it's a joy, it's a giddy, evil joy to watch until it's not, <laughs> until it's really not. And we want to go, stop, stop. We didn't mean to come with you this far. I think that's what makes him fun to watch. Well, he's, I mean, he's a wonderful blend of villainy and charm, I think. Shakespeare wrote, much like Richard III, somebody who's able to break through the fourth wall to an audience and say, watch what I'm going to do. In Iago's case, unlike Richard III, it, it, it gets much darker and more sinister quickly. I think, well, maybe not. Richard's pretty sinister early on too, but, but uh, I, I think there's an attraction to that. When Chris Abraham and I began to sort of mold this journey, we toyed with the idea because Iago addresses the audience so much directly, um, asks their input on it, although they can't speak. We really wanted to play with the idea of how long can we keep the audience on Iago's side? Because the longer we can, um, I think the more interesting the piece becomes until finally the audience is just sickened by what this man who has shared his journey with them is and, and, and has done. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's a great charm to that until it's not charming anymore. And I, I think if you look in the real world of psychopaths and, and extending that to horrible serial killers and all of that, quite a lot of them were able to get away with it so long because people just simply didn't suspect them. People thought they were the charming guy or gal next door and, and, until 
the crimes come out and, and, then, uh, and then it becomes a bit revolting.